Welcome everyone to the Hildebrand Project Personalism in the Professions series. It is so good to have you with us. This is a beautiful series we've created in order to discuss the ways in which the personalist tr tradition concerns us personally in our daily lives, in our professional life. And so we're doing this series. We had a la the last one on reverence and educating um, and the truth. That uh, episode is available on our YouTube channel, so you can take a look. That was with Professor John F. Crosby and uh, Dr. Maria Federica. So if you'd like, you can go and check that out. Today, our theme is shepherding and accompaniment in grief. And we have two excellent, well-loved, well-known to the Hildebrand Project priests to join us to speak about this topic. And what we do in these sessions is we pair them with a text by uh, von Hildebrand. And in this case, we are looking a little bit at his book, Jaws of Death, Gate of Heaven. And so no worries if you haven't read it yet, you will be inspired to take a look at it either again or to pick it up for the first time through the course of our discussion, I am sure. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a discussion with these two wonderful priests on this theme of accompaniment, especially in the face of suffering, death, grief, and caregiving. And then we are going to really open it up for uh, your questions, which you can submit through the question and answer function. You can submit those questions anytime throughout the course of the webinar, and then I will put them to our speakers uh, later on in the session. So thank you for being here. And in order to begin, I'm going to turn it over to Father Andrew Frimmel, who will begin with a prayer. Thank you so much, Amanda. Uh, Dieter von Hildebrand had a very close devotion to um, St. Francis of Assisi. And at the time of his own death, uh, there was a moment where he, he elevated, he raised his hands towards heaven, and he said these words, you are welcome, welcome, my sister death and then asked two of his brothers who were by his side to pray the canticle of the brother-son um, in some of his last moments. So I would like to begin now praying two verses from this holy canticle. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All creatures of our God and King, lift up your voice and let us sing. Alleluia, alleluia. Bright burning sun with golden beam, pale silver silver moon with softer gleam and thou most kind and gentle death waiting to hush our final breath oh praise him alleluia you lead back home the child of god where christ our lord the way has trod amen in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen all right thank you for that and now I'm going to invite each of our speakers to briefly introduce themselves and the kind of shape that their ministry takes day to day in order to kick off this session. And then we'll move into the thought of uh, Hildebrand in this work specifically, and also weaving together some of the very personalist reflections that both Father Andrew and Father Adam have to share with us. So Father Andrew, why don't you begin and share a little bit about what brings you here with us today? Absolutely. I'm a priest for the Diocese of Charleston. I'm a chaplain at um, Bishop England High School. It's a Catholic high school in Charleston. And um, my main ministry is to be present to these young people on on day to day, from classes to the field to the holy sacraments, um, and to walk with them and accompany with them on, on their journey of life. Um, I was invited uh, a few years ago when the book launch of Jaws of Death, Gate of Heaven uh, occurred, and it, it gave me the opportunity to really dig deeper in, into um, uh, the most recent last weeks of Hildebrand and his reflection on death. And I'm grateful to be here and, and to, to walk through um, with the people tonight as we reflect on, on this holy book. Thank you for that. And that's right, that Hildebrand wrote this book shortly before his own death. And so it's a, a special meditation on these themes. And uh, we're very fortunate to have it. Uh, Father Adam, over to you now. Sure. And Amanda, thank you. Um, you're a good interlocutor 
for our evening tonight. And we look forward to your contribution too, to uh, the particular topic at hand. Um, so I'm a priest of the Diocese of Toledo. Um, I've been in uh, ordained ministry 21 years. Um, I serve in, um, for our diocese, a fairly large parish in Finley, Ohio, of around 3,200 families uh, with a school. Um, my interest in personalism started first with an interest in von Hildebrand back in high school. Um, only later did it grow into uh, an understanding of what personalism was through Dr. Crosby at Franciscan, where I was a student. Um, I know you had uh, said that it's helpful to take anecdotes and make von Hildebrand's work come alive. And I, my own personality tends to be, uh, tends to lean towards the philosophic rather than the narrative, but I've done a little thinking and come up with a couple of anecdotes. Um, one I'll share now and another one I'll save till the, the very end. But 10 years ago in my parish in Toledo, I was getting ready on a Saturday night uh, for our evening mass. And uh, someone ran in from the parking lot and said, a man was just run over. So mm -hmm. I grabbed the oils and went running out into the parking lot. And sure enough, there was a man um, who his wife accidentally had run him over. He was up to his chest underneath the car. So I went up to him and there were others trying to treat him for shock, others calling for the ambulance. And um, he saw me and he says, oh, father, father. And he reached into his pocket and he goes, here's my envelope. <laughs> so quite quite unexpected on my part that that would be what he would be thinking about at that moment. Um, he was taken to the hospital, not injured in any serious way on account of being run over, but in the x-raying that they did, they found that he was riddled with cancer and he died within the next three months. And I was able during those three months to, in a sense, accompany him on his last journey. And it was a beautiful thing uh, just to see how um, his knowledge of his impending death really completed his conversion and set him up for a good death in the end. Thank you for sharing that. And it's it's really a, a joy and a gift to be back with you. Both of you uh, were together at the summer seminar and residency over, the, over this past summer, and we got to know each other there in person. And I, uh, there's nothing like it. There's nothing like sharing those conversations in person, but uh, we're happy to do it here. Uh, I'm Amanda Actman, and I'm the Special Programs Advisor with the Hildebrand Project. And one of my main priorities in life is preventing euthanasia and encouraging hope. So I do a lot of work around these themes of suffering, death, meaning, and hope. And uh, there's definitely a sort of apostolate of the Uber and apostolate of the airplane when people ask, what do I do for work? And I say, I, I prevent euthanasia and encourage hope. And it uh, is certainly startling. And yet it has been such a gateway to open up conversations of depth and people um, end up being very grateful for the occasion to speak. Uh, there's something cathartic and we speak far too seldom about the last things and the things of ultimate significance. So uh, this is an occasion for us to lean into that. And I think I'd like to begin by talking about how in this uh, excerpt that we've included, Hildebrand is discussing death as um, dying as life's most important act. That might be a kind of startling way of putting it. Father Andrew, what is it that makes death an act of being human, an act that could be described as even uh, among life's most important acts that a person would uh, either undergo or, or experience. There's this dignity that comes at the moment um, where you know where this life on earth is ended and that you will finally face the face of God, but also the judgment of God. And in spending time, especially in the earlier pages of, of Hildebrand, you know, the, the terror and the um, like incomprehensible separation that happens at the moment of death, I think makes it such a such a beautiful but also really scary moment that Hildebrand highlights throughout much of the book because 
he <laughs> he doesn't sugarcoat uh, or domesticate death, which I think so often in, in Christian circles or in my reflection on this, like almost like the vacation Bible school view of death of like, as long as you love Jesus and, and of course it's children, so you can't, you know, freak them out too much, but I think we could get into that later. There's this reality of, of aloneness of a person dying of going through, um, points to the realness of, of that moment that immortality of your soul is about to encounter the judgment of God. And the Hildebrand, I think, highlights the reality of, of that moment, especially as, as he's writing this book, as he's reflecting on his own death. And in follow-up to that, is there a way in which we are preparing, not only in that final moment, but particularly within the Catholic tradition that we're called to kind of be practicing and preparing? And, and what does that look like in the context of your ministry and uh, in, in sacramental life? I think there, as a Christian, there has to be at least an encouragement to reflect on the reality of death. I, I, I encourage this to my young people, <laughs> obviously during Advent and Lent, but pretty often to think about the effect of sin in our life and the reality of of what if something does happen in your life what if, what if you do pass away and meet god like are are you are you ready to say okay lord i i'm i'm ready to go to you are are you ready to make an account of, of your own life and so to answer your question more directly i think there has to be a a reflection at least once or twice uh during the year about if you are ready and this book I think makes a very clear um, theme about is one ready for death? Is one prepared for death? And is one ready to accept it? Uh, Hildebrand said, um, I must face the fact that I am losing the fight. It is time for me to face death and I have accepted it. And so reflecting on death makes one have to say, I'm accepting this reality or not. And to Father Adam's example, you know, getting hit by the car and then realizing all the cancer in his body, that man had to face death. And Father Adam was there to accompany with him and walk him towards, you know, the mercy of God, but also the judgment of God. Thank you. Father Adam, there's some very interesting reflections by von Hildebrand right at the beginning of this segment. And the excerpt is on the webpage of Personalism in the Professions, if people would like to look at it, on the nature of hope and the difference between hope and optimism. And could you speak a little bit about what is this distinction that Hildebrand is making? And what does it mean for hope to be the antidote to despair? And why is Christian hope so much more robust than a kind of facile or um, um, kind of conditional optimism. Sure. Um, I, I found his uh, description of the optimistic personality to be rather amusing. You know, if, what do you say? Like the uh, certain type of weighted toy <laughs> that's thrown up into the air and always lands on its feet. And uh, you can see, yeah, always lands on its feet until it doesn't. You know, and why does it land on its feet? Because of the nature of being a weighted toy. Um, so when uh, the, the weight doesn't play the factor that it should in terms of landing on its feet, it's, you could say, a disaster for the toy. And so um, merely natural optimism is just that. Um, over and over in von Hildebrand's writings, he, he always um, talks about, you know, the individual who is uh, blessed with a, a, a strong vitality. Um, uh, versus a person that is not. Um, there are many different natural factors that people are blessed with, um, and those are great, those are blessings, um, but they are less significant to the moral factors um, than the, the persons who we become by our, our free acting. Um, so the optimistic person is optimistic because that's just his nature, um, whereas the person who has the virtue of hope whether it be natural or a supernatural virtue of hope, they are such on account of a deeper insight that they have into reality. 
Um, and so the, the, the hope-filled person can actually be a rather depressive personality um, so long as they have that deeper insight that ultimately there is a God and he is a good God. Um, uh, ultimately, we are blessed with so many good things and that uh, all of that points towards something good in the future and an eternal good in union with him in terms of the supernatural virtue of hope. So um, it's a matter of, you know, recognizing, hey, if we are blessed as an optimist, that's great. Um, but there might come a day if we lack the virtue of hope where we're thrown off balance and that optimism gets crushed. And that's where despair can come in. And we can, we can see that sometimes in our, our, our visits to the sick and to the dying. Um, and of course, that's where our role comes in to help them to see something greater um, than what they're in the midst of. Um, and I have to say, maybe Father Andrew has a similar experience. Most of the time, with most of the visits that we make, um, the, the person does have that virtue. And maybe it needs to be amplified a little bit, but I could probably count on one hand, maybe two, the number of times over 20 years of priesthood where um, I felt that the person did not have the virtue of hope, um, did not have the bigger vision that there is a good God and um, he is awaiting us and longs for union with us. I will say, Father, I, I've had much more varied experiences in South Carolina. I'm grateful to to hear the, the people in your diocese are full of hope. I experience much more ambivalence and presumption um, uh, rather than a supernatural hope uh, of eternity in the, in the Lord. Um, you know, as I continue to reflect on so many of my experiences of walking with people near the times of death, there were three categories that yeah, I kind of came up with uh, one is that people did have a great sense of hope uh, joined with like a proper sense of God's judgment and and trusting in his mercy. Uh, two was that people did not face death uh, well um, and that there was a, a strong sense of fear that consumed them. And I think that ultimately was there was a lot of despair and there, there very much was not the presence of, of hope. Uh, and third, and I've seen this, unfortunately, a lot is ambivalence. Um, uh, Hildebrand a few times throughout uh, this book speaks of like um, a spiritual uh, blindness or, or spiritual, um, uh, not blindness, aw awakenedness. Like they are awake uh to the hope that Christ offers, but also a, a weight to the judgment that comes at the moment of death. Uh, it reminds me of a story where um, I got a phone call, someone was dying. Every, you know, I don't know about you, but every phone call I always receive, it's always like they're dying at this moment, and then you show up, and they're they're definitely not at the moment of death. You know, most of the time, and and um, this nice lady was very um, very conscious, and she was like. Um, okay, Father, you know, just come in and like do your thing. And, you know, aren't you, aren't you supposed to put oil on me and I just go to heaven or something? And I was like, um, uh, there are oils involved. Like that, that is a kind of a part of it. And I'm like, well, tell me about yourself, you know, the whole thing. And she starts to share about, um, you know, how she hasn't been in the church in you know, 40 years, but like her and Jesus are like, like, you know, they talk every once in a while. And, and there was this an immediate in my in my mind, like this presumption that she was just going straight to heaven because I can, you know, use my magical wand of the holy anointing. And and she was just going to go straight there. And so I I tried to, you know, you know, knowing that she hasn't been churched in a long time, like you can't, you know, there's only so many things you can say and encourage, but I, I wanted to do like a general asking uh, uh, and reflecting on life and and what does death bring up in your heart and and preparing to meet the lord and it was like she never did anything wrong there was no sin she's going straight to heaven and i remember walking away feeling very discouraged um and and hoping of god's understanding of of where she is and where her soul is but i i remember walking away thinking um how many people just find themselves at the end of their life not even spiritually awake to realize that they've done anything wrong and that they haven't a need to turn to God and his mercy and that judgment is right around the corner. Um, 
but there was definitely a many cases of ambivalence right at the very end. Well, that's very interesting. And I, I'm sure all of our, our listeners will find it immensely kind of intriguing what the experience is of ministering to the sick and the dying from the kind of standpoint of your of your own interiority as priests. What does this do for you? Is it sometimes hard for you? How does it change you? Do you have anything to say to say to that? There is a matter of it, it, it certainly makes um, the the life to come real, um, especially when you've accompanied someone for a long time and really gotten to know them. And then they pass through that dark door of death. And um, by God's grace, we uh, would hope that um, there can still be some measure of connecting with them, right? As we offer prayers for them, we know that that is true, um, that they know that we're offering prayers for them. And I often ponder that, that, you know, and wonder what they're thinking, uh, uh, what they're experiencing, but also what, what they're thinking about all those that they have left behind. And is there a sort of a, a mutual exchange of, um, in a sense, request for God's blessing in that? That was beautiful, Father. I, I find myself experiencing that and, and also a myriad of emotions. Um, there's times where I, I walk away full of hope, being so grateful to be a Christian, to be a Catholic priest. Um, you know, there was one moment where a, a woman's eyes, uh, she was unconscious for, I think, for almost three full days. And it was very close to the end of her life. And and I didn't know the family. Um, I come in near the end. Um, but I find out that she did live a faithful life and her family was supporting her. And there was a number of people in the room. But it, it was interesting because everyone was in the corner of the room. No one was close to her body. No one was close to the bed. And so as I was praying the, the commendation of the dying and um, we prayed the litany of the saints and and I I asked everyone to come over and to at least be near her body and if they felt you know inclined to maybe hold her hand or, or put her hand on her foot or something um as a sense of closeness to her and at the moment that we reached the our father her eyes opened up and she began to to say the words of the lord's prayer and she grabbed my hand and grabbed the other person's hand and you could just see everyone's eyes just like oh my gosh like god's grace like what is happening and this amazing just like experience of hope and the lord being present and and she died a few hours later um you know i walk away from moments like that like a, a, a as as great hope as a priest. And it reminds me, um, right at the beginning of the book, Alice uh, writes the foreword. So if, if you have any reason to buy the book, you know, also buy it for her words, because like, I don't cry. Some of you may be watching, you've met me, like, I'm I'm not a crier. That's the lesson. Like, it's just, it's got to get a lot for me to get going. The foreword made me cry because his eyes, he was unconscious. Um, the nurse was trying to say words to wake him up. He wasn't waking up. And, and Alice said a few words whispering in his ears and, and his eyes opened up and, and he invited, um, they invited father, um, uh, now I'm forgetting his name. I'm horrible. Um, and, and a few of their family and friends to come over. And as they were by his side, uh, he then begins to, um, ask for, uh, the Te Deum to be prayed. And he starts, he tries to sing. He tries to start singing the Te Deum, but he was so weak, he wasn't able to do it. And Father Bradley uh, uh, said the, the Te Deum, and he specifically asked to pray this prayer, asking or thanking God for the graces and the blessings that he received in his life. And he experienced um, also a, a little bit of a healing. And over the course of the next 16 or 17 days, uh, he actually was better until the moment of his death where he did pray the anima Christi. The last words of his mouth were uh, the words, soul of Christ, sanctify me, body of Christ, save me, blood of Christ, inebriate me. Like his last words were these. And and so like to answer your question, Amanda, like I walk away at times, you know, totally flabbergasted by God's grace and encouraged and so grateful Um but it also makes me walk away saying, okay, what are what are going to be my last words? 
uh, when I die? Um, are, are my last words going to be praising God or are my last words going to be of fear or, or, or worry or, 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 uh, of, of worrying about my judgment before God, the father. Um, and, and these are moments that I think should make us reflect tonight, especially all of us who are watching, like, what are our last words going to be, um, it's an important Thank you for that. And let's let's talk a little bit about when death is really less than ideal, because uh, thankfully in the personalist tradition, we we are particularly keen to take note of ethical exemplars, and yet part of Hildebrand's uh, approach is also to show the juxtaposition, juxtaposition to emphasize that contrast. And uh, you just described uh, von Hildebrand's own death and. It seems like quite a good and holy death. And uh, I mentioned that I focus on trying to prevent euthanasia. And of course, that's a euphemistic word that comes from the phrase good death. There's confusion over what constitutes a good death. And Hildebrand in this piece also talks about how death calls us to eternal concerns. But that's kind of in the in the best case scenario. What about when death shatters a person's faith or when death leads to the alienation and estrangement of, of family members, or this is what's happening at the moment of death. How can people who are not Christian be accompanied well by Christians in the face of suffering and death? Is there a way that we can meet people through our presence that will not be off-putting, but that will still bring Christ's touch to them in a way that will not... Um, be uh, off-putting. Uh, there are a lot of questions there, but I do think it's important that we just deal with the messiness of, of death when it is so much so far from the ideal. And I just want to remind our listeners to to add your questions using the Q&A feature, and we're going to be coming to those very shortly. Yeah, I think um, the, the charity that we showed to someone who suffers is one of the best things that we can do. You know, the mercy that are poured out in even the smallest of ways really um, can touch a person deeply. Um, and um, uh, sometimes maybe there's nothing more than we can do than that. And, um, and understanding that while death is a quickening, um, it's a quickening of a lifelong process of an encounter with the true, the good and the beautiful. And um, that also means we can't force some things at the moment of death. Um, uh, and we put the person into the hands of God. Um, uh, I love the lives of the saints, and and uh, sometimes though I you know I read like the Jesuit relations, and I say uh, maybe they were a little too forceful with some of those baptisms <laughs> right before death. You know, profess. You know, do you believe? Uh, uh, they were trying to do a great good, of course. So I don't doubt their motive. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, compassion and a gentleness is called for in the moment of suffering, in particular when that suffering is right on death's door. I agree. I think charity through the ministry of presence is important. Um, I think we all realize that, you know, we can feel very confident in many things in our life. Um, death is, is almost for most people, just something that's very uncomfortable. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. I remember one of my best friends, not best friends, good friends from high school. Her dad died um, from a motorcycle accident. Um, I think I was 15, 16 years old. And we all wanted to comfort her, but we didn't know what to say. And what ended up happening is a bunch of just awkward trite sayings are like, well, he's with the Lord or he's with heaven or I'm sorry. And it's like, I think depending on the circumstances, the charity comes through being present, not just at the moment where things start to be really hard, but in the following days and weeks afterwards of just checking up, how are you doing? How can I support you? I know it, it may seem like it's, it's not a lot, but um, in my experience with a lot of families, life is so busy and things move on so much that people also tend to move on with their own lives that they forget about those who've lost a loved one um, and just following up and being present. And, be, and I would also argue the need to 
to just say a lot less than you think you need to say. Um, and uh, be intentional about not saying kind of the normal things that are said at like a, you know, after a wedding, uh, after a funeral litur liturgy, it usually can be more harmful. Just something, I love you, I'm with you, a nice hug or a handshake and, and following up with them occasionally, um, simpler the better. Thank you for that. Now I see a question here and our, our questioner asks, what is important to consider when you are left somewhat speechless at someone's suffering? So uh, I, when I work with people um, in the parish, I say um, it is helpful to learn the the meaning of suffering well before one experiences great suffering um, that gives um, a framework that is becomes deeply enrooted in us in order to work through the suffering as it as it comes um, uh, so not to by any means instrumentalize another person's suffering for our good but in some ways we can grow from that in some ways, we can see the tremendous suffering that they're going through and try and place ourselves in their position um, to do what we can, as we just said, you know, to help to alleviate that suffering. But also, we learn from it, from the suffering individual. Um, and, and what do we learn? There's lots of lessons that we learn, um, one of which is that the person who suffers um, um, is and will remain a great gift to us. And their suffering draws forth from us love, um, which, um, uh, again, we don't want to instrumentalize their suffering for our sake, but we should give ourselves over to the process. We should take their, uh, their importance as a person very seriously and do what we can to help them in their need. And then secondarily, we benefit from that. And it's not a bad thing to recognize that we, we grow in love when we give ourselves over to assist those who are suffering. That's excellent. And it, it reminds me very much of Father Alfred Delp, who, after watching a Nazi propaganda film about euthanasia, he gave a homily about it. And in that homily, he spoke about how the dependent, vulnerable person makes an appeal to our inner nobility, to our sacrificial strength, and to our capacity to love. And if we take that person out of our lives, we can become egotistical predators. So just some really incredible words from a courageous German Jesuit who was then eventually killed by uh, the Nazis on the Feast of the Presentation in 1945. And I would recommend uh, there is a book that put together his writings. I, I forget the name of it, but it's it's there are Advent Reflections. Um, and I'm sure that'll be posted soon that are, are, are of great depth to walk through the season of Advent. So true. One of my favorite books, Advent of the Heart, published by Ignatius Press. So you can look for that. Another collection is called With Bound Hands. And I see that we also have uh, Father Delp's prison meditations uh, in the chat mentioned there too. So definitely warmly recommended uh, Advent reading. He spoke about how all of life is Advent and uh, this kind of waiting um, beautiful, beautiful. And he also has this point where he's, I think this is particularly fitting to mention now, where he's talking about the eternal truths that make it possible, he says, for us to light Advent candles in Germany in the Nazi period. He says, what, what, by what permission do we still celebrate and do we still light these candles? So this kind of feeling the weight of the anguish and suffering and um, realizing the need for the transcendent standard to anchor us and to be the basis for our festivity um, outside of um, outside of the circumstances. I think that's a, a sure sign of hope rather than uh, any sort of facile optimism. If I could add to that, Amanda, the, the reality of feeling the weight and gravity of, of suffering and death um, 
I think Helder Brand in his you know first three or four chapters highlights so well the the horror and the terrible um, reality of experiencing death and the moment and how none of us are we can intellectualize, we can read books, we can pray, we can go to 50 funerals in our life, but like, we don't know what it's like to die until you are the one dying. And if, even if you have the grace of having your family and friends by your side, you are still alone in that moment. Uh, you know, the, at the end of the, the liturgy, we, we, we sing, may the, may the angels be with you. You know, the church speaks of our, our guardian angels, you know, bringing us to the Lord for judgment, but there's still a reality that like you are still you in that moment dying. And, and it is really scary. Um, and I've experienced that too, being at the bedside of many people who don't have Christian hope. And I have seen fear in people's eyes. I'm sure father Adam, you, you've seen it too where there's this the reality of I know I have not lived a life that has honored God and many people can still turn to the Lord's mercy to me what can be more scary is when they feel like they don't deserve God's mercy and there was one man and you know forgive me I think I told the story at the book launch but it will forever be etched in my memory of this man who asked for a priest uh, in the town I lived in, he showed up and and he didn't want to talk to him. He didn't want the sacrament. So the priest left. Three days later, he called for another priest. The priest shows up, didn't want the priest. The third priest is called. That happened to me. Me, forgive me. It was my day off. I was already like trying to drive to the mountains of South Carolina and had to change and showed up a little bit uh, flustered that I had to go. So forgive me for my, you know, human weakness. I check with the doctor beforehand. I realize he has less than 48 hours to live. And I walk in there and he was like, oh, father, glad you're here. Can we make an appointment for you to come again? And in my mind, I was like, I no priest is ever showing up again. And I asked the family to leave the room. And I, I point blankly said, sir, what are you afraid of? And he said, Father, I left the faith in my early 20s. At least once every decade, the Lord made a very pronounced desire to get back into my life. And I rejected him every time. And now I realize I'm dying and I do not deserve the Lord's mercy. And, and that is why I'm resistant. And I shared with him the parable of the prodigal son He's never heard of it before. He starts crying and realized that he was still a son of the father and that Jesus desired to give him mercy. And he asked for the sacrament of reconciliation. And at that time before his life, he was reconciled before God. And that man was the most joyful person at the moment, at the end, after he received absolution and wanted to tell the rest of his family who was in the same boat, hasn't been in church for decades. And, and I said, this is your last parting gift is that you share with your family the need for real conversion. And it was only at realizing the horror of death and the, his need for God that he finally turned. And as I was walking out to where the family was in the, in the room in the front, I said, uh, he's gonna tell you something and you better listen. And they all just looked at me like, what just happened? But it's amazing how God's grace can work even at that last moment of a heart that's so hardened. But the horror and the terrifying moment of death and being alone and knowing judgment is hours away or days away, it just awakens within a soul, some people, not all people, the reality that they need God. Thank you so much for sharing that. What a beautiful testimony and it also reminds me of, of how Father Delp spoke about how the moment of death is a moment for great maturing, and we would not want to deprive such maturation as you just described in that beautiful story. So thank you for that. I want to come to Dr. Uh, Pete Colosi's question. He asks, how can we bring to evidence from a personalist perspective that euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide is wrong 
even in cases of severe pain, which seem to be an insurmountable hurdle for many people of our times, many of whom can be convinced that euthanasia or physician-assisted suicide should not be widely available, but who want it to be legal for severe pain and that doesn't respond well to pain meds. I think the best argument would be to be at the bedside to experience the beauty that you have described in your pastoral care. But is there a personalist response that can reach the hearts and minds of people of our day who have that hurdle of pain for wanting to legalize euthanasia? And then he asks me to chime in uh, based on my work as well. But I'll first of all come to you and then uh, and then I'll we'll loop back. Father Adam? Amanda, you'll probably have the best response of the three of us. But um, uh, so um, if by a personalist response, um, we mean it to be a purely philosophical response, I think that would be difficult. Um, but if we can expand into Christian personalism, then I think um, it becomes less difficult. And again, it's learning the, the, the meaning of suffering ahead of time. Um, and it's also recognizing that um, it is, um, it's, it's very much a call to us to do all we can to mitigate the suffering of the person. Um, uh, and that's where the allocution of Pius XII was uh, very prescient um, in terms of saying that uh, with the principle of double effect, um, yeah, we might see that a particular drug might hasten death, um, but that's not why it's given. It's given to uh, assist the individual with their suffering. Now, that being said, um, with, with enough forethought, um, enough prayer, enough sort of deeply integrating the church's teaching on suffering, one might freely forego that kind of treatment. Um, uh, it wouldn't be something we would want to impose upon the other. We want to work with the other where the other is at. And if their suffering is causing them to despair, then we do what we can to alleviate it, uh, but never killing them. Uh, because whose are we? And I don't think this is contrary to, a, um, um, to personalism. Whose are we? We are gods. Um, uh, God takes us. Um, just like whose are the animals? They are ours. We take them. Uh, but we are gods. In other words, we belong to God. Um, he takes us when he wants us. And he knows when the lessons we need to learn are, are done. Um, I don't mean that to sound harsh, but uh, that's all in the context of doing everything we can to assist the person in their need. Thank you. Father Andrew, do you have anything to add there? I'm grateful for Father Adam's response. I would be interested to see um, you know, your color that you would like to offer that question. Sure. Well, the question of pain is important, and I think it's it's often uh, necessary that we emphasize that the person deserves to have the pain alleviated through proper palliative care. And I am in contact with a lot of palliative care doctors who say that in 21st century North America, with adequate palliative care, people should not be suff dying in such writhing, horrific pain, because we know how to manage the physical pain properly with, with those medications. Now, in my home country of Canada, I think only 30% have access to that adequate palliative care, so it's gravely deficient. The first priority with this extreme physical pain is meeting the challenge of that physical pain. But I would raise the issue of total pain, which was the term that Cicely Saunders, the founder of the modern hospice and palliative care movement, used to designate the complete pain that a suffering and dying person experiences psychologically, spiritually, mentally, relationally. And that is often uh, really the pain that, that we have to go to with all our hearts to address. So in Canada, the government does a survey each year on the kinds of suffering that lead people to request euthanasia. And the number one reason why people give who are specifically asking for it is 
the, and when they're designating the kind of suffering that leads to the request, they say they have lost the ability to participate in the activities that make life meaningful. It's about 90% of people say that their greatest form of suffering, they may also have some physical pain. They may also have other factors like they feel that they're a burden or something like that. But the number one reason they give is that they have lost the ability to participate in the activities that make life meaningful. So this is a call to all of us to consider what activities do we participate in that regardless of our ability or disability, our age, our socioeconomic status, that we can still have those meaningful activities in our lives uh, in the face of, of suffering. And um, I can't resist kind of reflecting on Christ in the tabernacle and thinking, what kind of meaningful activities are you up to in there? What's he doing? What are his meaningful activities in the tabernacle? And of course, we know he is being present. He is loving and being loved. And I think part of Christ and the Blessed Sacrament, part of this incarnation to be with us is to remind us of this enduring human vocation that we are fundamentally made to love and be loved, and that this is the most meaningful activity of our lives that begins from the moment we are called into being at fertilization and endures until our very last breath. It is never diminished. And I think also that John Paul II, such a tremendous witness to this by living his life with such capacity in many regards, but then the witness that he gave um, as he was dying. So I don't know if either of you want to touch on touch on that, but he's certainly an, a personalist exemplar for us in that regard. I was always moved by um, a priest um, who shared with me, I don't know, maybe at the beginning of my college years, and, and he shared about just how profound the uh, really the decision of of St. John Paul II to be um, vulnerable in his sickness and in his dying in the last few years, where for the last four or five years of his life, like there was a public um, his deterioration of health was very public. And I believe that he showed how to be sick in a dignified way. He showed, and when he traveled, how slow he was and 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 being in a wheelchair at times and and speaking with a very soft voice and and with his hands shaking and and still proclaiming the love and the mercy and the truth of Christ to the nations, even as a very sick um and holy man that it, it it was almost like a fulfillment of his theology of like even at the very end our bodies are still the lord's and in sickness and in death there's still a great dignity in being a child of the lord and trusting in the lord's providence uh, for each of our own plans that God has for us. And so to me, I, I've always been um, encouraged to see that it was a gift for us to witness him being sick and him dying, and that that was a gift to the church um, as really almost a, a witness to the teachings that he taught us for, for 30 years. Yeah, that's that's so true. Got another question here. This is, is an anonymous question. And the asker says, I lost both of my parents during the pandemic. I survived. It was horrific. Family and friends came to con console, but very few were actually open to listen and pay attention to processing my enormous grief. What can you share about overcoming um, this uh, attitude of merely addressing death or near-death experiences uh, around efficiency, like attending to people's needs of arranging the funeral or running the household, um, but more on that that level of the processing of, of that tremendous grief. 
that is a very good question. And in fact, it, it, in my mind, it ties back to Amanda, what you were saying uh, a bit ago with the reason um, why people choose euthanasia. Um, the, the reason, as you explained it, it almost made me think of like the heresy of activism or homo faber, like we are what we do. Um, but I think with enough examination, um, I think we would come to the conclusion that in fact, these people aren't saying um, that I'm reducible to what I do. I can no longer do what I like to do, therefore I should die. I think what they're really saying is I'm lonely. I'm alienated. I'm left alone in the nursing home and no one comes to visit me except for the briefest of visits. Um, so um, just like Father Andrew said earlier, don't give pat responses um, to someone's great suffering. Um, you don't, you shouldn't feel compelled that you have to give any deep ver verbal response. Just your presence being with them is of huge benefit and your willingness to let them be themselves, go through their grief as they're going to go through it. And when they want, they can share what they need to share. The questioner inferred about um, like how to process with someone. Um, I feel like the question, how are you? Like is the worst thing to ask for someone who's like <laughs> grieving the death of a loved one or, or going through something horrible. Um, because at least, at least personally in my life, it's like, it's almost offensive. Like my mom died. It like, it's crappy. Can you not ask me that question? Um, I'm sorry for being so direct, but like sometimes like the questions can be so shocking to us. I think sometimes, um, if there is a relationship there and that the person you are a person that they desire to process with the questions about the heart, you know, where's where is your where's your heart right now what experience of sorrow are you experiencing you know is there is there anger or worry or sorrow not that you're trying to dig but just something to allow the person an opening to then begin to share and then really allowing yourself to be in the silence not feeling like there's a need to always respond um i think that's important like <laughs> it's okay to have a minute or two in silence uh, oftentimes in my experience, the person is just slowly beginning to verbalize the grief and the sorrow that they're experiencing and then being present to them in that moment and then allowing that suffering, the sorrow, the grief to be verbalized, to be actualized and to honor that grief and not to feel like we have to rush it. Um, I'm sorry if I'm going to offend anyone who works in you know funeral home ministries, but there's a sense of like, you get a phone call and they're like, well, let's choose a casket and let's find a date and let's get the readings. And it's like this really, really rushed process. And then the family doesn't really grieve until like three weeks later. And I realize that people do need to get buried and the process is necessary. But a part of me says like, can we just stop for a moment and allow the person to like tell a story about dad and grieve in a moment? And so to be more direct in that answer, I, I think allowing the space for the grief, the pain, the sorrow, and then honoring what they said is their personal experience. And that's where the personalist tradition really comes in because you're not trying to rush or or have the perfect response. You're just honoring them in that moment of grief. And I think that is a gift that we can give people in, in time of great sorrow. Yeah, oh, that's excellent. Thank you. Couple things come to mind, and and one is this beautiful definition. I think it's uh, Carol Hauslander uh, in the Stations of the Cross that compassion is defined as a communion in suffering of those who love. Mm. So it really involves that suffering with and and that communion. Like we we are not made to experience these things alone, and so part of the personalist tradition is also that need for community. There, um, we we need each other desperately in in these moments and there's also a beautiful book that came out recently called cry of the heart on the meaning of suffering and the author there talks about how suffering is not a problem to be solved but a mystery to be lived and this responsibility of co-suffering with others and if we took that seriously i think one of the things that i would really um, stress in terms of what we can do is affirm those who are caregiving 
and accompanying people well, because these are not things we ordinarily celebrate in our society. Many people are caregiving for years and years without sort of thanks or recognition. Many people are grieving, many widows and widowers, and for example, but so many others, we all have different forms of grief. And to simply take a moment and think about the people who are being heroic in bearing these crosses and commend them for it, affirm them for it, because part of that affirmation, it's good you exist, goes so far as to say, it's good you exist in the face of this suffering, bearing your cross heroically. And I see that in you. And I affirm that you are doing something noble. That would go so far. All right. Any, maybe I'll just uh, see. We've got a couple. Yeah, uh, we're just sharing those book recommendations there, and uh, a few other comments. Um, thank you for these these comments uh, in the in the chat. I'd like to just give each of you a moment to offer maybe some concluding remarks based on the overall discussion, and then I'll offer some uh, announcements to wrap up. Father Adam. Sure, I'll be very brief, and I'll come back to that other anecdote I promised. Um, it comes from my mom. So my mom was a nurse um, for a couple decades, and she saw many people die in many different ways. And um, I remember her saying to me, um, that uh, we spend our lives becoming the person on our deathbed and um, to constantly hold that before us, um, I think does a lot to transform us. Good, thanks. Beautiful, Thank Father you. Adam. I'll share um, just an encouragement to Reflect on our own death, our impending death, be it uh, a tragedy that comes out of nowhere. You know, how many people are texting and driving? Like, I mean, I honk at people at least four times a week because they're just drifting in my lane. I'm like, get out of the way, people. Like, we never know when death could be. It also could be for the majority of us who get sick and we're able to prepare for death. I, I think now is the time to always be ready for for our own judgment and to realize that if we're not turning to the Lord often, even daily, sin does enter into our lives and it can harden our hearts. And to one of the earlier questions about how I feel as a priest and the eternal things that happen in my heart, I have walked away multiple times worrying for the salvation of someone's soul because their heart was so hardened they didn't even feel like they needed God's mercy and I walked away disheartened and really praying and fasting that God does something in their heart or that God's merciful understanding is beyond my little feeble brain and you know the need to reflect if we are ready at least a few times a year I think is 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 a bit awkward and tough, but it also allows us to say, as an honest examination of conscience, if we are ready for the Lord's judgment and what kind of life that we are living and if we are following the Lord. It's a bit harsh, it's a bit dark, but I think it's a beautiful part of our tradition to realize you know, that we we need to reflect on these things. And as we started off with the prayer of St. Francis in the Canticle, you know, oftentimes he's remembered about, you know, the guy who talked to animals and everyone loves the St. Francis blessing, you know, of the dogs at their parish, which Father Adam may do. I, I don't do it because I feel like it encourages a false understanding of St. Francis. The guy walked around with a skull in his hand and constantly talked about death. And so I feel like, there's a reality that that's a beautiful part of our tradition and it keeps us spiritually awake as was one of the major themes of Hildebrand in this, in this great book. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, this was excellent. Thank you, Father Andrew, Father Adam for being with us. And um, I really, again, recommend to everyone the Jaws of Death Gate of Heaven book by Dietrich von Hildebrand. It's a short book. It's 
very substantive though. It's accessible and yet it's it's packed with depth. And so I do check that out. We have another session coming up. It will be on the entrepreneur with a few entrepreneurs in conversation with Hildebrand Project president and founder, John Henry Crosby. That is taking place on Wednesday, November 8th in the same time slot. And um, you can get all of the details for that on the website and, of course, in the emails that we send around. So be sure to join. That will be all about Catholic social teaching and business. If you have thoughts on these on this series on personalism in the professions, you can always email us and share your ideas, your feedback, your further questions, reflections that occur to you. We can also try and make a roundup of the resources that have been mentioned and resources and recommendations that have come up during the session available to you afterwards. So uh, be encouraged and uplifted in your effort to live the personalist tradition in whatever your professional life looks like. And uh, God bless you. Thank you for joining us and see you next time. Mm -hmm.